Let's take a look at the higher derivatives of a function. So what's the idea here? If I have a function f, we could take its derivative. Notation for that will be f prime of x or df over dx in Leibniz notation. So there's nothing stopping me from taking f prime and applying derivatives to that over and over again. So here, we want to make sure we know what the notation looks like. So if I take f prime, take the derivative of that, that's what we're going to call the second derivative of f. We'll write that as either f double prime of x or in Leibniz notation, d squared of f over dx squared. Now you want to be careful with this because in the Leibniz notation, d squared of f over dx squared is not the same as df over dx quantity squared. So an example that shows that, just let f be equal to x squared. First derivative is 2x, second derivative is 2. So d squared f over dx squared is 2, df dx quantity squared is 2x squared, which is 4x squared. So those two things are definitely not equal. So you just need to be careful with that. Now, in general, if I take n derivatives, we're going to call that the nth derivative of f. That's notationally going to be f parentheses n superscript of x, or in the Leibniz notation, d to the nth power of f over dx raised to the n. Let's look at a concrete example for this. Now, I'm going to have my function, polynomial, x cubed minus 12x squared plus 4x plus 2 take its derivative. That's going to give me 3x squared minus 24x plus 4. Do another derivative. That gives me the second derivative. That's going to be 6x minus 24. I do another derivative. We're going to call that f triple prime. That's going to be equal to 6. And then I have fourth derivative that goes to 0. Let's note for the fourth derivative, say, we could write this as in Leibniz notation, okay, d raised to the 4 of f over dx to the 4th. So you'll encounter both of these when you read through calculus. So what's the physical interpretation of the second derivative? Let's consider motion in a line. So here, I'm going to have a position function, s of t, where t represents time. Take the derivative of that, I'll get the velocity function, so that's just going to be the instantaneous change in position over change in time. Then if I take the derivative of that function, I'm going to have our second derivative. That's what we're going to call the acceleration function. So that's the instantaneous change in velocity with respect to time. Now, let's look at a basic example. So we're going to have a rocket on a platform 50 feet high we're going to send it up with initial velocity 100 feet per second. It's going to go up. Gravity is going to act down on it. So it's going to go up, it's going to stop, and then it's going to fall back to Earth. So in this case, our position function is going to be given by 50 plus 100t minus 16t squared. I take the derivative with respect to t. I'm going to get 100 minus 32t. Take another derivative. It gives me the acceleration. We get minus 32 and that has units feet per second squared, that's going to be gravity, which is a constant, at the surface of the Earth. Let's look at another example. So I'm going to have position function given by 2t cubed minus 6t squared. And what we want to do is find all points where the acceleration is equal to zero. So what do I need to do? I take one derivative, I get velocity, Take a second derivative, I get acceleration. Set acceleration equal to zero, and that'll get me to my answer. So if I take one derivative, we're looking at 6t squared minus 12t. Take the second derivative, I'm gonna get 12t minus 12. We set that equal to zero. That's gonna give me t equals one. So the acceleration is gonna be equal to zero at the point where time equals one. So that's our answer. If you want the position, you just put that back in to your original equation. So that'll happen when we're at position minus four.